Ah, epic Mickey. Where do I even begin? Like most ADHD-riddled Gen Z children, I grew up playing lots of video games. Sonic Heroes and Spider-Man and Venom Maximum Carnage being two of my favorites. But the first game I was ever actually really anticipating was Disney's Epic Mickey. The rumors started swirling in 2007-ish, and I was immediately hooked on the concept. A dark, gritty look at forgotten Disney art, cartoons, attractions, and merchandise starring the most well-known cartoon star of all time. I mean, just based off this terrifying concept art alone, I'm fully sold. I was thrilled from the start, and when the game was eventually released in November of 2010, I argue that it delivered on nearly every front. Minus that ungodly frustrating camera system, good lord. Purely on concept and enjoyability, I was in love with the game from the second I picked it up and it still remains my favorite video game to this day. Now an iceberg image is a chart with layers of knowledge regarding a certain topic and the further down the chart you go, the more obscure the information becomes. There are so many icebergs covering so many different topics. I actually already did one a few months ago about my chemical romance. So go check that out when this is over. But one I haven't found a video on was an Epic Mickey iceberg. So when I found this iceberg created by Epic Mickey Wiki Admin Goomba Broadcast, I knew what had to be done. Then I found out I was working on an outdated image and found the newer one and then kept going. No, oh, it's fine. It's not like I was three fourths of the way through the original script anyway. No biggie. But seriously, thanks so much to Reddit user Slaycap for their help with this project and for pointing me in the right direction when it came to finding the right image. What I plan on doing is going as in-depth with each entry as possible to give an at least half decent explanation as to what they mean. More info may exist on some topics than others, so forgive me if I go on a bit of a tangent sometimes. Before I get started, I want to preface this by saying that a lot of the information presented here comes from my own knowledge of the game, as well as help from members of the Epic Mickey subreddit and the general community, as well as research from various online sources, all of which will be linked in the description. It's possible I could get something on here wrong, and believe me if you watched the My Chemical Romance one, you know I got stuff wrong, so feel free to correct me in the comments. This is as much a learning experience for me as it is for you, so I'd be happy to take any criticisms you might have. Even with lots of research and prior knowledge, there are some concepts and even specific entries that I'm not entirely 100% knowledgeable on. So similar to Mishkaz's Mario 64 iceberg video, I'll be using the health bar from the first game to indicate my confidence in what I'm talking about. Full health meaning more confident, depleted health meaning less, you get it. I'll have some gameplay footage playing in the background by YouTuber AJBRUN, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, because I'm a broke college kid with no way to capture my own gameplay, so links to their channel will be in the description as well. And finally, if you are are a fan of the series or just like the research, don't be afraid to hit like and subscribe so I can make more content like this in the future. Putting this iceberg together has been a ton of fun and I'd love to get to do more of it. And with all that out of the way, grab yourself a snack and a drink, pop on your headphones, and get ready to face the depths of the epic Mickey iceberg. Let's begin. War Inspector. This name's gonna come up a lot throughout this video, so we'll kick things off here. War Inspector was the creative director of the series and the head of Junction Point Studios until their closure in 2013. After the success of Deus Ex, he met with Disney in 2005 to pitch some fantasy RPGs until the company shared their idea for a Mickey Mouse game to which Spectre immediately said yes. From that point on, it was his passion project and it's very clear when watching or reading interviews about Epic Mickey. His plans for the series only further proved his love for it and makes it even more heartbreaking that it was cancelled with the closure of Junction Point in 2013. Chase Jones Chase Jones was the lead designer of the series. He's very active on his socials and often answers fans' questions regarding certain aspects of the game, scrapped or not. In an interview with Liam Robertson of Unseen64, he was very outspoken on his love for the games, but was not afraid to discuss his frustration with Disney Interactive over time constraints on Epic Mickey 2 and the subsequent cancellation of the series. I'll be sure to link the Unseen64 video in the description. James Dooley if you're a fan of the game's score like me, you have James Dooley to thank. His compositions for each game are part of what made them shine in their originality. A lot of the score written for the first game was reused for the second, but he did not compose the 3DS spin-off Epic Mickey Power of Illusion. That was the lesser-known indie composer Sean Beeson. Junction Point Studios 
After leaving development company Ion Storm, Warren Spector and several other ex-employees decided to start their own studio. Opened in 2004, Junction Point would be given work on many new projects, including a canceled addition to the Half-Life series, before Disney Interactive would acquire the studio from Universal in 2006. Junction Point would be given the reins to Disney's new Mickey Mouse game and any of its follow-ups until their forced closure in 2013, bringing an end to the Epic Mickey series. It is sad that the studio was closed prematurely, but I do find it poetic that Junction Point and Oswald were purchased from Universal around the same time with Warren being the animation buff that he is. Granted, it was because Disney wanted Junction Point to make the Mickey game featuring Oswald, but it's just sweet to me that Oswald's rights and Junction Point were both owned by Universal for so long until Disney stepped in. Oswald's story. And now we get into more lore territory. Before the creation of the famous mouse, Walt Disney was making cartoons for Universal. His Alice comedies did well with audiences, but his most popular cartoon by far at the time was Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. From September 5th, 1927 to September 3rd, 1928, Oswald would play in theaters to critical acclaim. But when Walt went to Universal to renew his contract, the animation giant declined, leaving Walt without a flagship cartoon to keep his business afloat. However, not the type to give up so easily, Walt went back to the drawing board, quite literally, and within less than two months, Michael Rodent himself made his silver screen debut in Steamboat Willie on November 18th, 1928 and was an instant success and the rest as we all know it for mickey is history but while mickey saw his rise to fame oswald was fighting an uphill battle failing to see the popularity of his younger brother for decades oswald would see numerous changes to design and overall structure of his cartoons becoming a far departure from the original walt disney version of the character by the 1950s universal had stopped producing oswald cartoons altogether but after a half century in obscurity, Disney decided they wanted Oswald back. Traded for ESPN sportscaster Al Michaels, Disney won the distribution rights for Oswald back in 2006, and the first time he would be seen in his original style since 1928 would be as the sympathetic antagonist turned cohort he appears as in the first Epic Mickey game. He's constantly shown to be jealous of Mickey's success over the years, knowing that it was always meant to be his. Origin of the Gremlins Gremlins are your teleporting handyman sidekicks throughout the course of the two games. They first appeared in Roald Dahl's 1943 children's book, The Gremlins, which is a version of the stories told by the Royal Air Force about the creatures during World War II. Disney was set to create a film version of the book, but the project was later shelved for unknown reasons, leading to the characters to become forgotten and arrive in Wasteland. That is, if we're going by the game's lore. Sweepers, based off of the Magic Brooms. Sweepers are a variation of the Blotling enemy found throughout the Epic Mickey series. They're called Sweepers because their designs are nearly identical to that of the Magic Brooms featured in the iconic Sorcerer's Apprentice segment of the 1940 Disney film Fantasia. Play Style Matters Warren Spector refers to the morality system throughout his games at Junction Point as Play Style Matters, meaning one's choices throughout their journey will ultimately determine the story's end and every playthrough of the game has the potential for a different ending. Something similar to the butterfly effect. Using paint in certain circumstances will grant a much different ending than using thinner. In earlier versions of the game, the player's choices would even change Mickey's physical appearance, but we'll get to that a little later. Music changes. So I'm not entirely positive what this entry is in reference to, but I do have two ideas. One, the original score for the game sounded much different than the final product, and honestly, listening to what the main theme was going to sound like earlier in development, I wish they'd stuck with it. I think the final theme and score are wonderful, but the original theme has this sense of whimsy, but also fear and anticipation to it that I just really like. Or two, depending on your choices, the music will shift with the lighter layers of the music being emphasized should you choose the paint path and the darker layer being emphasized should you choose thinner.
You know, in retrospect, I feel pretty strongly that the second answer to this entry is what was supposed to be referenced, but I'm just glad I got to talk about the original theme for the game because I just love it so much. Spatter Ears. This entry has to do with how the spatter enemies in the game have ears similar to Mickey's, and I personally believe that this is because the blot was originally shaped like Mickey before evolving into its nightmarish demon form we see throughout the first game. The block creating smaller duplicates of itself to take on the one who has created it in its own image does not seem too far-fetched, at least to me. Tune Hearts Every tune in the cartoon world is created with a heart, and if a tune is not able to maintain their popularity, they lose their heart and arrive in Wasteland. Any tune with a heart who arrives in Wasteland is able to return to the cartoon world, but those without are stranded in Wasteland for good, which is why we see the Mad Doctor attempting to steal Mickey's and Oswald considering taking it for himself at the end of the first game. Tints and Terps This is just the name for each of the different colored guardians that float around Mickey's head and show him where to go when he's lost. The blue paint ones that can befriend enemies instantly are called tints, and the green thinner ones that can instantly destroy enemies are called terps. But some enemies will need more than one of each type of guardian to be overcome. Epic Mickey 3. This is going to be a long one, so I'll get it out of the way now. Epic Mickey 3 is the cancelled third installment of the Epic Mickey series and supposedly the finale of the entire story. I've heard Warren Spector say on separate occasions that the saga was planned to be in three, four, and five parts, and I'm not entirely sure which is exactly the case, but nonetheless, the game was scrapped with the closure of Junction Point in early 2013. The game would have revamped many of the new features in Epic Mickey 2 with more playable characters, possibly allowing for more multiplayer options, more world building, and more music. In fact, Spector wanted the third game to be a full-blown musical. In terms of plot, not much is known, but we do know that the game would have taken place outside of Wasteland, at least in parts, and the villains would have likely been the group of Pete's we saw kidnapping Gremlin Prescott in the post credit scene of Epic Mickey 2. Concept art exists for a playable Hortensia as more of a combat-based character with hands made of stone, as well as art of one of the Pete's dressed as Snow White, having captured the princess and trapping her in a magic vanity mirror. Obviously, I am super bummed we never got to see the third game in its original vision with Junction Point and Warren Spector at the helm. While I hope the game would have gone back to a darker tone similar to the original game, I still would have been happy to enjoy the experience for what it was, and even though Disney still owns the IP, it's unlikely we'll ever see a return to the series, at least in the near future. But with recent leaks and rumors going around of a remastered Switch port of the original game, you really never know. Maybe a remaster will breathe new life into the series and introduce it to a wider audience, paving the way for a potential Epic Mickey 3. Hero and Scrapper Mickey. This comes back to Spectre's concept of playstyle matters. In earlier drafts of the original game, depending on your choices, Mickey's appearance would change, similar to the way the music changes in the final game. Using paint to fix your problems and befriend enemies will grant you control of Hero Mickey, who has a more flesh-toned face, his clothes are much brighter, and he's seen sporting golden gloves as a nod to his first appearance in color. Destroy everything and erase enemies with thinner, and you would have unlocked Scrapper Mickey, having a generally drab color palette and very few friends. Find somewhat of a middle ground and you'd look like Wastelander Mickey, which honestly looks like just the final model that appears in the first game. One of my favorite YouTube videos growing up is this almost 10 minute Game Informer interview of Spectre explaining the early mechanics of the game, including the aspects of Hero and Scrapper Mickey. It'd be crazy for me or the Junction Point team to presume to tell all of you what makes Mickey cool. The greatest thing about games is that they offer players the opportunity to make their own choices, their own decisions. And that means we can let each and every one of you tell us what you think makes Mickey cool. Is Mickey the happy, helpful hero of today? Behave like that and you'll become our hero Mickey, like the guy you see here. He's I'll link that whole video in the description if you have any interest in checking it out, which you totally should. Ditto, Epiculus. 
On November 30th of 2010, SoundCloud artist Ditto unveiled a new track in celebration of Epic Mickey's release called Epiculus. It's an admittedly very catchy mashup track that's made up entirely of music and sound effects from the game and its trailers. I remember in middle school I had this song on my iPod and I listened to it pretty religiously. The entire song will be linked in the description if you want to support Ditto or just give the song a listen and I totally think you should. Japanese version differences. Overseas, Epic Mickey has a few differences when compared to the international version. In some screenshots, there's specifically a noticeable difference in the game's lighting, as the international version is much darker in spots than the Japanese version. There also appear to be some additional instructions in the Japanese version that don't appear in other territories. Finally, some scenes deemed too violent were cut from the Japanese release, such as the Mad Doctor using the mechanical arm's sharp tools to threaten Mickey in the game's second opening cinematic. It's also worth noting that the box art is much brighter than what is seen in other regions. I honestly like the Japanese artwork a lot more. It pops and is generally more appealing. It's not a major difference, but I do wish this was the art that all regions got. Steamboat Oswald if you look at the marquee of the movie theater in both console games on Mean Street, a film called Steamboat Oswald is apparently playing. This is an obvious jab at Steamboat Willie, the first Mickey Mouse cartoon after Oswald's rights reverted to Universal. It's crazy to think that Steamboat Oswald likely would have been a real cartoon had Disney not gotten to hold on to Oswald's rights. Wonderland when Epic Mickey was planned to be a quadrilogy, a level based on the classic Disney film Alice in Wonderland was expected to appear in each game, but was cut due to time constraints. Plus, Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland and Epic Mickey were in development around the same time, and Spectre wanted to avoid confusion for those who hadn't seen the 1951 version of the film. Colonel Pete Before you can enter Lonesome Manor, Big Bad Pete asks you to find tapes featuring his possible ancestor, Colonel Pete. It's believed that this version of Pete is the one who appeared in Disney's Alice comedies and the early Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoons. Walt's Apartment Once every projector screen on Mean Street is active, and of course you give Gremlin Marcus his precious power sparks, you can access a secret room on top of the firehouse. This room is actually a recreation of Walt Disney's own apartment in Disneyland, and he would often visit to keep an eye on his employees and make sure the guests were having the most magical days of their lives. Gremlin Gus even gets choked up when he realizes where you are upon entering. Inside the room are two gold Oswald e-tickets and this piece of artwork, which is one of the few drawings Walt ever made of Mickey and Oswald together. The room actually makes a return in Epic Mickey 2, but to unlock it, you have to fix the clock over the train station, set it to 4.30, and ring the bell over the fire station. This time, inside will be one Oswald e-ticket and a Meet Your Maker pin. Adorable. Epic Mickey Path Painter Disney Interactive released an online Flash game called Epic Mickey Path Painter that uses the same physics as the Wii game, but uses 2D sprites in isometric environments. Paint and thinner are still used, but the only enemies that appear are spatters and you can't use paint to befriend them. The game also uses different names for characters than the console game, such as calling the blot the Phantom Blot, and the bunny children are referred to as the Bunny Kids. Finally, Oswald doesn't appear at all in the game until the very end, and it's only in a cartoon that must be obtained through gameplay. Due to Adobe Flash being discontinued, the game cannot be played online, but it can be downloaded through archives. Mickey Junk Mountain based on real Mickey Mouse merchandise. This one kind of speaks for itself. The Mickey Junk Mountain level of the first game is filled with old, forgotten Mickey merchandise that actually did exist at some point in time. Be that a Mickey Mouse Club button or an old lunchbox, most, if not all, of the items seen in the introduction to Mickey Junk Mountain actually existed at one point in the character's history. Red-Eyed Blotlings this one is also pretty self-explanatory, just blotlings with red eyes. They're more dangerous and more difficult to defeat than their regular green-eyed counterparts, but they don't show up until late in the game, specifically in Tortuga at the earliest. Bog Easy, named after Big Easy. Bog Easy is a New Orleans-inspired level in both of the console Epic Mickey games. Big Easy is just a nickname for New Orleans, and Bog Easy is a swamp, hence Bog Easy. Popular character likenesses in Wasteland. 
Some characters made specifically for Epic Mickey tend to bear pretty striking resemblances to forgotten Disney characters. One good example of this is the Spirit of Wasteland, a floating ghost-like head who gives Mickey and Oswald the Spirit of Wasteland quest in Epic Mickey 2. He looks very similar to Casey Jones, specifically Disney's interpretation of the American folktale character from the 1950 cartoon The Brave Engineer. The Black Hole and Tron references in Tomorrow City. The talking robot Vincent, featured as a character in Disney's 1979 flop, The Black Hole, appears in both Epic Mickey console games. He cameos as a breakable item in Tomorrow City in the original, and his parts can be seen within some of the blot works in the sequel. The character Pete Tronic appears in both console games. His design is clearly based off of the Tron films, and his boss fight at the end of Tomorrow City only proves this even further. The Blot's cameo on the outside of the cinema. In Epic Mickey 2 on the outside of the cinema, spray thinner on the far back wall and the face of the Shadow Blot, the villain from the previous game will appear. Maybe it was meant as an eerie easter egg to say that the Blot still looms in the shadows of Wasteland, but we'll get to that later. Game Informer Demo God. In October 2009, Game Informer released their Epic Mickey promo issue, featuring screen grabs of early test footage of the game and interviews with Junction Point staff. The demo itself was very short and a far departure from the final product, containing many scrapped mechanics, models, and way more. Chase Jones stated years later that the demo they brought to Game Informer was so short because none of the game's levels were completed at that point in development. I actually, to this day, still have my copy of the Epic Mickey Game Informer issue from 2009 and it's still in pretty decent shape. It talks about the original morality system concept and even the game's original, much darker aesthetic. Super cool stuff, if you can find a copy somewhere online, do yourself a favor and pick it up. Beanstalk Factory in the same vein as Wonderland, the Beanstalk Factory is a location that exists within Wasteland, but is not playable for unknown reasons. It's visible in the first game's map as well as the opening cutscene, but it is not a location Mickey can travel to. The factory itself sits on top of a beanstalk and resembles a revolutionary factory with three large smokestacks on the roof. Tunes and projector screens. So I'm gonna level with you. I had such a hard time with this one and I honest to God do not know why. It turns out uh, I was just thinking too hard. Uh, when you go into projector screens, such as the Steamboat Willie screen, you'll notice some characters as they appear in the cartoon make little cameos throughout. These tunes don't seem to be sentient. It's a little scary to think about if they're just props or if they're maybe characters stuck in some sort of weird purgatory for what lies after Wasteland if there even is such a thing. I really am thinking too hard. Marble Busts. The busts inside the Lonesome Manor level are the same heads inside of the Haunted Mansion ride within the Disney parks. They can give you hints if you talk to them, but they can also be easily destroyed with a spin attack. Lifters Lifters are a scrapped variation of beetle works that were cut from the first game due to the Wii's memory limitations. Chase Jones has said that lifters would have used their single giant arm to throw Mickey off ledges or into thinner pools causing him to take damage. Blot Wars before the events of the first game, a battle was fought between Oswald and the Shadow Blot over control of Wasteland. The Blot had banished Oswald and Hortensia to Mickey Junk Mountain, where the two took on the Blot one final time in a battle that turned Hortensia inert, a state of matter within Wasteland that isn't affected by paint or thinner. Essentially, she was turned to stone. However, Oswald was able to hold the Blot within the Jug, leading to the events of Epic Mickey. The Jug is spilled and the Blot is unleashed once again. Third way to defeat animatronic hook. Every boss fight in the game, for the most part, has two different ways it can end, but the animatronic Hook boss has a third method of completion. The good ending is to summon Pete Pan to fight off Hook himself, and the bad ending is forcing Hook off the plank to be taken care of by the animatronic version of TikTok, the crocodile from Peter Pan. However, Mickey has the option to bring down Hook's health by throwing him into the beams of the ship until he falls apart. The ending of this fight is different, but Mickey is still rewarded as if he had just completed the thinner route or the bad ending. Hades Head Tanker Concept art shows a Beetleworks variant with the head of Hercules villain, Hades. Ultimately, this design would go unused in the first game, but did appear in Epic Mickey 2. This design also shows up in that 2009 Game Informer demo we talked about earlier. Fun fact, its torso is actually made of parts of Mickey's car, so that's a cute little touch. 
Club 13. In the Blot Alley level of Epic Mickey 2, Pete Tronic can be found in Club 13, a reference to the infamous ultra-exclusive Club 33 within Disneyland. And no, nothing scary or disgusting happens within Club 33, it's just a space for the rich and famous to eat and lounge at Disneyland, away from all the poor people. Leaked 2007 Concept Art This Scrapped Beetleworks This Person calling on the telephone in Mickey's house. This. Oztown is the wasteland version of the Mickey's Toontown attraction found at Disneyland, featuring homes of some of Disney's Fab Five. When you enter Mickey's house, you'll find the telephone that was seen in the 1936 cartoon Through the Mirror. I'll be referring to the phone as they, since the gender changes between Epic Mickey 1 and 2, and I don't want to confuse anyone. The phone themselves aren't able to make any calls, but after a series of side quests, the telephone will have enough reception to receive outside calls. One of the calls they receive says, Mickey, pick up. It's me. I know you're there. Get your dog off my lawn. Can you tell I'm an acting major? This is an obvious reference to Pluto, Mickey's dog and best pal for nearly a hundred years. Because we don't hear a voice attached to this call, the person making it is not known, but seeing that it's a neighbor, it can be deduced that this is either Pete or Mortimer Mouse. I find it important to note that in Epic Mickey 2, the telephone themselves is voiced by none other than Kristen Schaal, the actress behind the characters Mabel Pines from Gravity Falls and Louise Belcher from Bob's Burgers, two of my favorite animated TV shows. Mickey Junk Mountain Basketball Room This secret area is so obscure that even some official strategy guides completely miss it. Toward the beginning of the level, you're faced with the choice to either destroy 10 blotling enemies or paint in two TVs in order to open a gate and proceed to the next section of the level. But if you pass through this yellow Mickey Mouse birthday show poster, you'll find a secret room with a chest containing a gold pin as well as a steam pipe that will launch you through a basketball hoop on the opposite end of the room. Epic Mickey Graphic Novel This is exactly what you think it is. A 64-page graphic novelization of the first Epic Mickey game, released as part of Disney's Epic Mickey Tales of Wasteland Digicomics. The plot is pretty much exactly the same as it is in the first game, but there are a large number of minor differences, including, but not limited to, Gus being freed by Mickey but is already free by the beginning of the game, Oswald living on top of Mickey Jung Mountain, and Mickey not having to complete any trials to meet with him. There is no Oz Town. Animatronic Daisy doesn't appear at all, and neither do the Bunny Children and Mickey never confesses to Oswald that the Thinner disaster was his fault. If you want to give the graphic novel a read, the entire thing can be found online, and I highly recommend checking it out. Denizens of Wasteland are aware of the real world. Sometimes the game and its characters are aware of their audience. God. When we watch cartoons in what we call the real world, the characters within the cartoons become more popular, but the tunes who don't receive enough attention from us are sent to Wasteland. In interviews with the team behind the Epic Mickey series, it's said that tunes who reside in Wasteland are made aware of the real world's existence and how their unpopularity caused their exile, which kind of makes me feel guilty. So many characters wind up in Wasteland because we don't give them enough attention that they rightfully deserve. Granted, most of these characters weren't still relevant when a lot of us were alive, but still kind of sad. NPC inconsistencies between games. This entry might connect to what I said earlier about the phone. Between the two console games, there are lots of things that just don't connect. Like the phone being referred to as he by Gus on multiple occasions in the first game, but as female in the second game. We do support a trans icon, but I doubt this was the intention. With the 3DS spin-off being developed by an outside studio, some things slip through the cracks as well, such as none of the NPCs from the console games outside of Oswald appearing in Wasteland. But many plays a pretty decently sized role despite never Ever appearing in the two main titles. I could be wrong about what this entry is in reference to, so let me know if I goofed. Power of Illusion takes place after Epic Mickey 2. Hi, so this is me during the editing process. Initially my plan for this entry was I don't think it's correct and here's why, and then I figured out my argument is completely invalid. Some of the points that I made I guess I just totally made up, and I was not about to falsify information for you guys. So I went back and did some more research again and um, I couldn't find anything until I found this post on the Disney Epic Mickey subreddit posted by Epic Mickey fan. I'll just read it verbatim and then I'll link the original post in the description so you can go 
check that out and give them the credit they deserve. Power of Illusion Theory. So my friend Spladouche on Discord came up with this theory that Power of Illusion is actually a dream Mickey has while he's in Wasteland after the events of Epic Mickey 2. I think the game makes more sense as a dream with all the Disney characters he met in the Toon world and the new brush mechanics that don't make sense in universe. Now I know this may seem dismissible as just another dream theory, but I think it makes more sense than other dream theories. And honestly, I think that holds weight, so do with that what you will. Okay, back to your regularly scheduled programming, bye. Room under Oswald's Sanctuary. Mickey Junk Mountain is what Oswald calls home following the Blot Wars. He'd built himself a sanctuary within Mickey Junk Mountain, where Mickey himself finally meets Oswald and must complete a round of trials to prove himself worthy of the rabbit's attention. Inside the sanctuary itself is a print of Oswald's face on the floor that can be thinned out to reveal a hidden cavern that, when traveled down, reveals a room filled with models of the main locations within Wasteland and the attractions they hold, such as Space Mountain and Dark Beauty Castle. In the rafters and across thin pools, Mickey can find a bronze, silver, and gold pin to add to his collection. This is just a neat little easter egg, and it's honestly really fun to think that someone just stumbled across this. Dark Beauty Castle Hallways Named After Magic Kingdom Utilidors the gothic castle that begins and concludes the story of Epic Mickey has many different pathways and hallways throughout. These tunnels share a name with the infamous Utilidors, the tunnels that run underneath Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World that cast members travel for easy access to different areas of the parks. Donnie Hamilton Concept Art Donnie Hamilton was a concept artist for the series. You may have even seen some of his work not knowing it was official. Some of these pieces are older ideas and concepts for villains like the animatronic pirate or the phantom blot, but a couple of them in particular depict a much darker version of the game. This creepy art is a much earlier version of what Scrapper Mickey could have looked like and appears to be inspired by the 1995 Mickey Mouse cartoon that Disney wants you to forget about, Runaway Brain. Another piece shows Mickey shooting paint and thinner from his body instead of what would become the iconic brush that he carries in all three mainline games. Pipe Organ in the Mad Doctor's Attic the pipe organ appears as a side character in the first game in the Lonesome Manor Ballroom. His music wards off the ghosts to bog easy, so Mickey must help fix the organ in order for the ghosts to come back. In the Mad Doctor's Attic in Epic Mickey 2, you can see a shrunken version of the organ hiding in a closet. Epic Mickey Tales of Wasteland Back in the day, Marvel was in charge of making Epic Mickey comics for Disney that could be purchased on the Epic Mickey app that sadly no longer exists. However, some countries outside the US did see limited print releases of these comics. They just serve as fun side stories that don't add much in terms of the narrative of the games, such as Oswald and the Donald and Goofy animatronics trying to clean the Small World Clock Tower, or Oswald hiring Detective Horace Horsecollar to find his missing feet. Some of these stories can actually still be purchased through Amazon, but they can all be found online. Epic Donald After the success of the first Epic Mickey and during the production of Epic Mickey 2, some of Junction Point's main team split up to start work on spin-offs such as Epic Donald, a title that never made it past the pre-production stages. The game would have obviously followed Donald Duck as the protagonist, but would feature a more light-hearted tone than Epic Mickey. Blitz Games, the UK-based studio who had a hand in the development of Epic Mickey 2, created a gameplay demo for the game but would never be greenlit by Disney. It's said that the game would have taken place within the DuckTales universe, featuring appearances from Scrooge McDuck, Donald's nephews Huey, Dewey, and Louie, as well as familiar villains from the classic cartoon. Two characters that also would have made major appearances were Mickey and Goofy in certain levels. It's unknown if any of these other characters would have been playable. Many levels and missions were already planned out, one even including money hungry zombies yeah i'll have more info linked in the description if you want to check out the remains of epic donald for yourself and you thought this entry was done this is totally unscripted but i'm trying to be as clear and concise as i can i just received a message on reddit from user darth mall 321 with a link to the epic mickey wiki that features tons of information and concept art for epic donald that I previously hadn't even seen before. So this is a huge find and huge, huge, huge thank you to Darth Maul 321 for sending me this.
This post details entire levels and gameplay mechanics, and it is way too long for me to summarize here. So please, 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 please go check this out when you're done. All this stuff is so cool. And the Carl Bark inspired concept art is just so beautiful. In fact, this user even had a full on conversation with one of the concept artists in the comments of this post, Pat Block. And he went into a lot of detail on what working on the game was like, even throughout its really short lifespan, what inspired his work, and a bunch of other things he really wishes could have been implemented into the game, even though it didn't end up happening. Without talking on it for too long, this is such a cool find. As soon as we finish discussing here, please go check this out. Epic Donald is definitely one of the more interesting aspects of this iceberg, and I've really enjoyed getting to find out a bunch of new things about it. So if you're in the market to learn some more new things as soon as we're done here, go check this out. And again, huge, huge thank you to Darth Maul 321 for sending me the link. The links to their page and this post can both be found in the description. Epic Mickey Movie Warren Spector had lots of interest in a film adaptation of the first game and sent Disney multiple renders and a mock-up trailer as a pitch to get the film put into production. Sadly, this would never come to fruition. Not much is known about the film, why Disney turned it down, or even if the pitch trailer still exists. But personally, I don't blame Disney for not wanting to jump the shark with a game to film adaptation. By this point, video game movies were, more often than not, major flops and taking that risk with their most popular and well-known characters Character might not have paid off. Bad ending is canon. This entry is in reference to the large amount of evidence that Epic Mickey's canonical ending is in fact the bad ending or the thinner ending. For example, in Oztown during the first game, Clarabelle Cow tells you about a noisy safe outside the gag factory that's hanging over Pirate Moody's head and inside it is a trapped gremlin Prescott. Mickey has the option to either paint Moody's house and he'll give you the combination or he can take the easy way out by using thinner on the wooden beam that's holding the safe in place, causing it to land directly on Moody's head. Either ending frees Prescott, but the actual canon ending seems to be the thinner route. This is further proven when talking to Moody in his house in Epic Mickey 2. He claims to have lost his memory due to some accident, likely a reference to the incident with the safe in the first game. In Epic Mickey 2, it's implied that Mickey did in fact destroy the clock tower with thinner in the previous game, suggesting that this is how the first boss battle is supposed to end. Gremlin Sug this is a scrapped character meant to bring out the selfish side of Mickey. He would offer Mickey health upgrades in exchange for animatronic Donald's parts. He was essentially the anti-Gus, hence his name. There is no existing official art of the character that I could find, but some of his written lines do exist online. This isn't a point on the iceberg, but do original scrapped characters from the Epic Mickey series also end up in Wasteland in some sort of like meta way? I mean, Wasteland is where scrapped and forgotten Disney characters go, so it would be ironic if original characters made for this game that were scrapped end up in a Wasteland beyond Wasteland, if that makes any sense at all. Castle of Illusion in the Epic Mickey 2 Wasteland map. On the map of Wasteland released before Epic Mickey 2 and Power of Illusion, you can see the Castle of Illusion on the left side next to Dark Beauty Castle. Why it isn't seen in the console games is unknown, but this does make it canon that the two castles do exist in the same universe. It does still muddy the waters on when the game takes place though. The Bunny Children Constantly Escape City Hall Big Bad Pete will present Mickey with the Bunny Roundup quests in which Mickey is tasked with rounding up all of Oswald's kids, the Bunny Children, and sending them to the jail on Main Street. Oswald isn't exactly a huge fan of this and doesn't particularly like Pete already, but he knows his kids will likely escape anyway. This is further proven by the sound of the children traveling back through the pipes as if they were returning to their cells only when Mickey enters the jail. Hot Topic Merchandise the major pop culture retailer Hot Topic created a number of Epic Mickey related products to promote the game's releases. When the series was shelled, these products went with it. In 2020, Hot Topic released some new t-shirts with entirely new designs related to the Epic Mickey series, which put the entire fan base into a tailspin with many, including myself, believing this meant a revival of their beloved series would be coming soon. Sadly, since we are almost halfway through 2022 and have received zero news on a return to the series, I'd say the odds aren't exactly in our favor. My theory is that these were created to celebrate the game's 10th anniversary. Garbage from the Disney parks is sent to Wasteland. 
If you've ever wondered why the Disney parks are always so clean, it's explained in the Epic Mickey graphic novel that Yen Sid's magic is used to expel all of the trash from the parks to Wasteland. This entry also ties into another entry that we'll talk about later down the iceberg. Epic Mickey 2 Banks and Pirate Pete. I'm gonna kill two birds with one stone here because they flow into each other pretty well. Several prototypes from the Epic Mickey 2 databanks exist in video form online. A quick Google search will show you just how many of these prototypes exist and what they were originally going to be. Some of these include a simple physics test, a test for the Autotopia racetrack, and a 2D subway system level constructed by the Gremlins that would likely end up becoming the Doll Engineering Corridors or DECs. One of these banks even includes the textures for a Pirate Pete character who never actually appears in the series. In addition to these textures, leftover dialogue mentioning the character and even a fully programmed model of him riding a scrapped Zeppelin from the 2009 Game Informer demo exist within the files of both Epic Mickey 1 and 2. The Mad Doctor's attraction is California Adventure. In Epic Mickey 2, the Mad Doctor is seen building a new ride that ultimately becomes boss battles with him. This ride is made up of miscellaneous pieces of real-life attractions at Disney's California Adventure Park next to Disneyland, such as California Screamin' and King Triton's Carousel of the Sea. Another fun fact, some of the platforms on the lower part of the ride are made up of pieces of Euro Disney's kinda sorta now defunct space mountain De La Terre a la Lune, unrelated entirely, but you should really check out Defunct Land's video on this particular ride. It's one of my favorites out there, and I didn't think I'd ever get a chance to talk about it, so thought this would be as good a time as any. Pete Costumes in the Mad Doctor's Attic Thinning out certain areas within the Mad Doctor's attic in Epic Mickey 2 reveals some of the Pete costumes seen throughout the series. Are these costumes? They look far too big for the Mad Doctor to wear. <laughs> it's a simple little easter egg, but it may have something to do with the scrapped concept of Pete working as a spy for the Mad Doctor in the game's original plot. Or maybe the Petes were using the Mad Doctor's attic as a hideout where they could scheme up their diabolical plot that unfortunately never came to be for the third game. Grem <coughs> Gremlin, Gremlin Jam Face unused in first game. Jam Face is the gremlin who oversees the projectors, making his first appearance in Epic Mickey 2. However, he is mentioned in the first game's Game Informer exclusive issue we talked about earlier. He isn't seen at all in the first game, but dialogue for him does exist within its code. Unused Drop Wings in Epic Mickey. Drop wings are another variation of the blotlings that were conceptualized for Epic Mickey. Due to programming difficulties, drop wings were dropped ah, 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 from the first game, but they would appear in its sequel. Based on this piece of art, the enemies would likely have been just the average spatter, but with wings as opposed to the floating blobby mass that appeared in the second game. Splodoosh's Original Behavior these are another variation of blotlings that are much larger in size and have the ability to explode. One can first be seen in the Mickey Junk Mountain portion of the first game. Due to their immense size, they do not have the ability to move. However, early concept art, this image in particular, shows that they were able to walk at some point in development. This element was scrapped as well and likely served as inspiration for the slobber enemy that also appears throughout the series. Three Little Pigs Unused in First Game Similar to Jam Face, the Three Little Pigs, as they appeared in the 1933 Silly Symphonies cartoon, were planned to cameo in the first Epic Mickey, but were scrapped for unknown reasons. But animations for one of the Three Pigs has actually been found, making it the only scrapped character from the first Epic Mickey with existing character animations. Abe's original design and his misinforming the fan base about the Stormblot these two entries have to do with the same character, so I decided to combine them just for the sake of time. The Automatic Branch Engineer, or Abe, who appears in Epic Mickey 2 is an animatronic created by Gremlin Prescott to watch over the train tunnels and is designed after the Abraham Lincoln animatronic from the Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln attraction in Disneyland, something made abundantly clear when you look at his design from early development. Just straight up Abe Lincoln. Upon revisiting the train tunnels later in the game, Abe says, But what Mickey didn't know was that there was another blot, a storm blot, one that could destroy all of Wasteland. 
I'm almost positive this entry has to do with the unused concept for Oswald to merge with the blot to create the even deadlier storm blot, which we'll talk about later on in the iceberg. And the reason it's misinformation is because the storm blot was a scrapped character that would never appear in the series, and I could be wrong. If I missed something, let me know in the comments. Topolino. An Italian magazine called Topolino had two issues focused on the Epic Mickey series and even had some of the Tales of Wastelands comics in it. That's pretty much it. Animatronic Hook's Origins. The Mad Doctor created Animatronic Hook to serve as the captain of the Pirates in Wasteland. He and Pete Pan fought rather regularly exactly as the original Hook and Peter Pan in the original Disney film did, and the Mad Doctor wasn't exactly a fan of this. The Doc put an end to Animatronic Hook's fights with Pete Pan, causing the robot to go into a frenzy, turning many of his crew members into the Basher enemies. Novelization Written by Carla Jablonski, the first game's novelization follows the game's events pretty closely, but does omit a few plot points such as Gus's house being destroyed by the clock tower as opposed to being thinned out in the game. Not much to this one, kind of similar to the graphic novel entry minus the really beautiful illustrations. Digicomics app I mentioned the Tales of Wasteland comics, and those were most easily found on the Epic Mickey Digicomics iOS app created to promote the first game. The app featured the aforementioned comics, trailers, the entire map of Wasteland, and so much more. When Junction Point met its end, so did the app, but if you previously downloaded the app at some point before it was taken down, you can still access it and all of its contents. Mickey still contains the blot. At the beginning of Epic Mickey, it's revealed that Mickey has absorbed part of the blot, which can be seen throughout the entire game as it appears that the black ink is dripping off of him. Well, not dripping because it sort of floats instead of dripping to the ground, but you get it. By the game's end, it seems the blot is destroyed, but if you're willing to sit through the closing credits, a final cutscene plays showing the blot-esque black drip on Mickey's finger once again, teasing the inevitable sequel. The Exact Functions of Inert there are two states of matter within Wasteland, Toon and Inert. Toon items can be thinned out or painted in on a whim, but inert items aren't affected by paint or thinner. Beetleworks are actually made of inert mechanisms and robotic parts covered in a shell-like layer of paint to protect them, which Mickey can erase to destroy the animatronic enemies. Something worth mentioning is Hortensia's being put in an inert state during the Blot Wars, leaving her in a statuesque frozen state. Pete's Motives with Prescott I personally think this has to do with the unused dialogue for Pete in the files of Autotopia and Epic Mickey 2. At last, check out For Pete's Sake, coming soon to all TVs in Wasteland <laughs> and beyond. Pete was originally going to have his own TV or radio show that broadcasted throughout Wasteland, but this story aspect was cut from the final game. But wouldn't it be interesting if the Petes had all gotten together and kidnapped Prescott in order to broadcast their show into the cartoon world so they could escape Wasteland? I think this does hold some weight if you consider the fact that the third game was supposed to take place, at least in part, in the cartoon world, with the Petes serving as the primary antagonists. Just some food for thought. Beetleworks were originally designed for maintenance. There exists a piece of concept art labeled Wall Maintenance BWX, which could imply that Beetleworks were created simply to restore Wasteland. This could also mean that they were more neutral enemies, only attacking when threatened. Empty Gremlin Cage in the Mad Doctor's Lab Inside the Mad Doctor's Lab is a cage that could normally be broken open to reveal a friendly gremlin who will reward you for saving them by making your journey even the slightest bit easier. One particular cage, however, is empty. This could actually be the cage that was supposed to hold Gremlin Gus, seeing as in the game's original story, Gus was to be trapped in one of these cages only to later be saved by Mickey. Terminator Pete Early concept art shows the changes made to Pete Tronic before his design became what it is now. One of these looks very similar to the T-800 model of robots from James Cameron's Terminator films. Funny enough, the design used in the Epic Mickey graphic novel definitely has its fair share of resemblance to the classic Terminator look from the movies. The Real Daisy Duck appearing in Tales of Wasteland Animatronic Donald, Goofy, and Daisy were all to appear in the Tales of Wasteland comics. While Animatronic Donald and Goofy did, Animatronic Daisy was mistakenly drawn with her Cartoon World counterpart's appearance. The Identity of the Robot Dog 
This entry is in reference to the horse horse collar quest in the first game, in which you're asked to locate dog tags in the Tomorrow City level that belong to a robotic dog, specifically in the Space Voyage section of the level. There is no existing imagery of this dog, sprites, concept art, or otherwise, but because of the existence of animatronic Donald, Goofy, and Daisy, it's possible this robot dog could be animatronic Pluto, or it could potentially be a reference to the space dog from the Space Mountain attraction in Disney parks throughout the world. The dog may belong to Mr. Rover, who is the only toon in Tomorrow City if you don't count Petronic or any of the gremlins found here. Epic Disney Racers a spin-off racing game was planned for an unknown release date called Epic Disney Racers and would feature classic animated Disney characters as well as established characters from the Epic Mickey series. Obviously, this would never come to fruition after Junction Point's closing. Gus's Unused Tortuga Dialogue There exists an out-of-bound glitch in Epic Mickey and the Tortuga level of the game involving Gremlin Gus. Should you complete this glitch, a creepy line of text spoken by him that does not appear normally in-game states, Dead men tell no tales. It's unclear what the purpose of this text was supposed to be, but the next text says, Worked as promised, let's head through, referring to the projector screens. Because it's only acceptable via glitching, it's clear that this dialogue was meant to be cut for release. Special thanks to Epic Mickey Wiki user Nintenshibe? Nintenshibe? I'm butchering this, I'm sorry. For your post about this entry that I'll link in the description. Porter becomes a blot spirit. Porter is a generic, cow-like NPC who first appears on Mean Street after Mickey defeats animatronic Hook. Porter says he is new in town and his friend, Rufus McBark, is giving him the grand tour. However, after Mickey defeats the Mad Doctor and returns to Mean Street, Porter is nowhere to be seen. During the final confrontation with the Phantom Blot, new enemies called Blot Spirits that are possessed NPCs met throughout the game who mindlessly attack Mickey and are immune to paint and thinner attacks. One of these Blot Spirits looks very much cow-like, leading many fans to believe that one of these spirits is Porter after being absorbed by the Blot. Once the blot is destroyed at the end of the game, all the spirits return to their original form, so regardless, Porter is still alive and kicking. Hashtag Team Porter. Oswald Blot. Remember the Storm Blot we talked about earlier? In the game's original story that saw Oswald playing a more villainous role, he would merge with the blot, becoming a monstrous creature called the Storm Blot, capable of destroying all of Wasteland. The blot would essentially possess Oswald, giving the new monstrosity seemingly limitless power until Mickey could convince Oswald to do its right and move on from his vengeful ways. Play Magic Something else we talked about a while ago was the rumor of a remastered port of the first Epic Mickey that began swirling in late 2019. What led fans to come to this conclusion was the aforementioned Hot Topic merch released at the same time, as well as an employee of game development company Play Magic listing a remake of a Disney action game on his resume. After two years, it's hard to say if this is actually happening or if it was just mere speculation. Either way, Play Magic is at the center of the rumor and have yet to release or even announce any new Disney projects, so who's to say? Play Magic, if you're watching this and you're working on an Epic Mickey remake, please let us know soon because this suspense is absolutely killing me. Also, I, I did put a lot of work into making this video. Uh, perhaps you could uh, shoot me a free copy. Uh, that would be awesome. The implications of multiple versions of the same character. This one's a little confusing, so bear with me. Cartoon characters go through redesigns all the time, and Disney cartoons are no exception to this. You see those t-shirts or posters or even Funko Pops showing the different iterations of Mickey Mouse throughout the years, meaning that the most modern design is the version of the character most people look toward. Mickey is such an icon that every version of him, for the most part, is looked upon with love and remembrance among Disney fans. But when it comes to less popular characters like Horse Horse Collar, for example, some of their designs aren't as culturally relevant causing them to end up in Wasteland, while the fan-favorite versions remain in the cartoon world to continue serving their purpose as a star. Simply put, out with the old, in with the new. The Canon Fate of the Shadow Blot Epic Mickey 2 seems to treat the first game's thinner ending with the Shadow Blot as canon, seeing as the Blot doesn't appear outside of a small easter egg on the cinema wall in the second game. The sequel also does remind Mickey of the Blot's defeat from the last game, which is pretty much the nail in the coffin for that theory. I personally think the canon ending is the thinner route. I love the different routes you can take and the argument that comes with what makes each one canon, so let me know what you think. Clarabelle's design is unique to the game. 
Another simple entry with a heavy implication. Clarabelle is a classic Disney character, though not known nearly as well as the Fab Five or Sensational Six, it changes sometimes. She's seen lots of design changes over the years, but her particular design in Epic Mickey is one that has never been seen outside of the games. Maybe this design of hers is a scrapped one that never made it into a cartoon, similar to the many different designs of Pete within Wasteland. Horus appearing in Wasteland before the Thinner Disaster. You've heard me talk about the Tales of Wasteland comics a lot at this point, but seeing as they are in fact canon, any noteworthy story beat within these comics is a major topic of discussion. Horus appears in three of these comics, and since they are all prequels to the first game, he was obviously in Wasteland before the thinner disaster that Mickey caused. In addition to this, Horus can be seen in a flashback cutscene as a wave of thinner rises above Mean Street. Scrapped Castle of Illusion enemies appear in Epic Mickey Power of Illusion. This one is more of just a theory thought up by the creator of this iceberg. During a behind the scenes trailer for Power of Illusion, concept art for armor enemies just kind of shows up. It's not really related to anything that's being discussed on screen. It was just kind of assumed that this concept art was from Castle of Illusion and brought back for Epic Mickey Power of Illusion. There's no real documentation of this concept art anywhere outside of the video, so there's no real way to confirm it. Scrapped content used in the graphic novel. Some elements of the Epic Mickey graphic novel were actually scrapped concepts that didn't make it into the final release of the first game, like Mickey freeing Gus at the beginning of the story. Neverland Peter Pan's home Neverland was originally planned to be a location within the series, but was changed into what would ultimately become Ventureland. The one and only Chase Jones went on record to say that the Neverland level would be canned because it just had too much to do in it that would distract from the game's main plot. Original Tanker Design This entry is in reference to an early design for the tanker, showing it missing both of its cannons with a single arm that doesn't appear in the games. This design could have brought about a much different villain than what we see in the series. Epic Mickey 2's Original Plot in the second game's original story, we would have seen Mickey returning to Dark Beauty Castle in search of the Mad Doctor, only to be captured and have his heart and the remnants of the blot removed from him in order to revive the blot and merge with it. Big Bad Pete would have served as a spy for the Mad Doctor until seeing his blot works kill, yes, kill, Gremlin Prescott. Pete would tell Mickey and Oswald of the Mad Doctor's plans, leading to Mickey's decision to destroy his own heart and the blot along with it. Yen Sid would have been moved by Mickey's sacrifice and given him a new heart so that he may return home. Yen Sid would also have given Oswald a heart of his own, but Oswald would ultimately choose to stay in Wasteland. If I can give my two cents, because that's exactly what it's worth, I think this plot would have been way more interesting than what we saw in the final game, and I wish this is the one that we'd gotten. The Occurrence of Blot Spirits we talked about the Blot Spirits a while back, hashtag Team Porter, and how they are mindless, zombie-esque versions of characters met throughout the first game. But what's interesting about them is that Oswald and Gus, who also appear in the game's final level, are not turned into Blot Spirits simply because someone must be hit with thinner to be turned into a Blot Spirit, and these two have not been affected. While most versions of the game leave the fates of the spirits unclear, in the Spanish version, Gus states that the characters turned into Blot Spirits return to their normal lives after the Blot is destroyed. Large Mickey Blotlings and Raged Monster. I put these two entries together because they both refer to discarded characters that never made it past the concept phase for the first game and were, quite frankly, very intense. This piece of concept art shows Mickey battling a much larger sized Blotling designed to look like him, complete with the iconic ears and red shorts with white buttons. And this art shows what I personally think looks like a Venus flytrap-esque Blotling that would travel around by splashing into puddles of thinner. These enemies would have had large, sharp, jagged teeth and would presumably spit thinner as a method of attacking. Epic Mickey Olympic Spinoff Similar to Epic Disney Racers and even Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, another planned spin-off that never made it into production was an Olympic-style party game. Characters from the series were expected to appear and concept art does exist for other classic Disney characters such as Maleficent and Hercules. Epic Mickey-based Disney Park Attraction 
I cannot for the life of me find this interview anywhere, but I know for certain an interview with Warren Spector exists in which he discusses not only the then pitched Epic Mickey film adaptation, but his hopes for a Disney Parks attraction based on the franchise. It's not clear what kind of attraction he envisioned, but as someone who tries to visit Walt Disney World pretty regularly, it's a shame we never got to see this dream realized. And if anyone knows about this interview that I'm talking about and knows where to find it, please leave a link in the comments so everyone can go check it out because I have spent way too long trying to find it. Animatronic Minnie and Pluto Animatronic versions of most of Disney's Sensational Six are scattered throughout Wasteland. We're aware of the existence of animatronics Goofy, Donald, and Daisy, but what about arguably Mickey's two favorite people, his love Minnie, and his best pal and dog, Pluto? The answer is simple, they were cut. Animatronic versions of Minnie and Pluto are nowhere to be seen in the series. We talked about it a while back, but it is speculated that the dog tags you're asked to search for by Horus in Tomorrow City belong to a robotic dog believed to be animatronic Pluto. Regardless, it is super interesting that even though we have animatronics inspired by Mickey's best friends, Minnie and Pluto are left out. I personally choose to believe that because Goofy, Donald, and Daisy animatronics were built as friends for Oswald and he already has Hortensia and their 420 kids, which is hilarious by the way, he has no need for a robot girlfriend or even a dog, especially with how full his hands are as a powerful figurehead and family man. Mad respect Oswald, you're killing the game dude. Walt Disney originally created. Warren Spector originally wanted to fill Wasteland with concepts and characters designed during Walt Disney's lifetime. This ultimately wouldn't be realized, as there are several elements within the game that were created after Walt's death in 1966, such as references to the 1979 film The Black Hole, Tron, and parts of attractions from Disney's California Adventure serving as pieces of boss battles with the Mad Doctor. Scrapped Blotworks Designs these two pieces of concept art from Epic Mickey 2 show two cut versions of blot works that were equal parts blot and machine, one version looking more like the sweepers and another resembling the slobbers, constructed with pieces of Herbie the Love Bug. Unused Beetleworks in Epic Mickey 2 during the credits of Epic Mickey 2, conceptual artwork for unused versions of the Hopper, Spinner, and Basher enemies is seen. These unused beetleworks can be found fully modeled in test levels. Shout out to wiki user Rampant Leaf for being the one to find them. Ursula. Ursula appears as an antagonist in Epic Mickey The Power of Illusion, but she was also supposed to appear in the first game. She would have shared her useful information about Wasteland with Mickey to help him on his journey home. Because the level would have been set within the jug and possibly underwater, having Ursula appear here only made sense. Prescott's Original Fate. Epic Mickey 2's original story saw Gremlin Prescott on the side of Mickey and Oswald instead of turning evil. However, this cancelled script saw Prescott fall to his death at the hands of one of the Mad Doctor's inventions, making it the first time a hero siding character would canonically die in the series. Blackbeard Disneyland and Walt Disney World opened Pirates of the Caribbean on March 18, 1967 and December 17, 1973, respectively, and both featured the infamous pirate Captain Blackbeard throughout the ride, later to be replaced by the crew of the Johnny Depp movies, along with many new original characters. Regardless, the opening day Blackbeard animatronic was given the boot. How does this connect to Epic Mickey 2? In Ventureland, the pirate crew will tell Mickey that they've been kicked out of Tortuga by none other than Blackbeard himself. While this iteration of the captain is never seen in-game, it's a pretty safe bet that the Blackbeard originally in Pirates of the Caribbean and the one mentioned in Epic Mickey 2 are one and the same. Unused Sketches the sketch items Mickey can use throughout Wasteland feature a TV which can be used to distract enemies, a watch to slow down time for a brief period, and an anvil to crush enemies, weigh down pressure plates, or help Mickey access places too high to jump to. There's also a fairy sketch in Epic Mickey 2 that allows enemies and objects to float for a brief period. Originally, the first Epic Mickey was going to feature balloon and fireworks sketches in addition to the aforementioned ones. There was also to be a vending machine Mickey could have used that would either give him a sketch or a useless item like a dud bomb. Disney closed down Junction Point Studios immediately after the release of Epic Mickey 2. Disney Interactive acquired Junction Point Studios from Universal in 2006 and pitched their Mickey Mouse concept to them and we know the rest. Two games later, Disney Interactive shut Junction Point's doors in January of 2013, mere months after Epic Mickey 2's release. It's been widely speculated that this is due to Epic Mickey 2's poor sales and critical response when compared to its predecessor, but ex-Junction Point staff have since spoken out stating that this is, in fact, not the case, and that sales data hadn't even been calculated in such a small time frame. Disney 
immediate closed junction point due to Disney Interactive's change of management in 2010 and their desire to move to a strictly mobile market. Disney would begin licensing their IPs to outside studios as it was more cost effective and wouldn't look bad on Disney as a company should the game flop critically or at retail. Oswald is unaware of originally being owned by Universal. We already know that Walt Disney made the Oswald cartoons as part of his contract with Universal in the mid-1920s, but it doesn't seem Oswald does. As far as the character himself is concerned, Disney just up and abandoned him to pursue his Mickey Mouse cartoons. When Universal refused to renew their contract with Disney, the rights to Oswald reverted fully to Universal, meaning that they had full custody of the character and could do whatever they wanted with him. The game's plot seems to suggest that Oswald is either fully unaware that he was owned by Universal, or this version of the character is the one that existed before Disney lost the rights to him. Kind of like the villains in Spider-Man No Way Home getting removed from their universes just as they were about to die. Oswald is Doc Ock. Super Goof. Believe it or not, Goofy has a superhero alter ego called Super Goof. His first appearance as Super Goof was, ironically, in the second issue of the Phantom Block comics from 1965, and even had his own series until 1984, later popping up in other Disney media. He was actually planned a cameo in the now-canceled Epic Donald. Epic Mickey Incubation. On July 12th, 2021, wiki user Robbie YT attached the LinkedIn page of UK senior animator Alex Webster, which featured a since-deleted credit for a project called Epic Mickey Incubation, slated for a 2011 release. Obviously, this game doesn't exist, and if it ever did, it was never completed. But was the game ever real at all? And if it was, what was it? Side note, Alex Webster was one of the few who had any kind of work on the cancelled Epic Donald, so maybe Epic Mickey Incubation was the working title for a series entry that he he worked on and didn't have the time to finish. Pink Elephants on Parade Projector Screen in 2020, a cut 2D projector screen level from Epic Mickey 2 was leaked online inspired by the pink elephant scene from Dumbo. The scene in question comes to be when Dumbo and Timothy Mouse hallucinate after drinking champagne. It's believed the level was cut due to the original scene's alcohol reference and its effect on the game's age ratings. The Blot and the Blob comic Printed in 2019 in the Norwegian Donald Duck comics, The Blot and the Blob is a story about the Phantom Blot discovering the Blot from the Epic Mickey series. When the Phantom Blot breaks into the Mouston Museum's parallel universe exhibit looking to unlock untold evil, he comes across none other than the Blot from the first game. Yes, in 2019, an obscure Norwegian comic published a story featuring a character from a series of games that had been cancelled for over six years at the time. Outro Black Pete Chase Jones stated on his Twitter that there were some bigger plot lines for Black Pete planned in the series. Of course, there is no character named Black Pete in the game, so whether he misspoke or named a character we've never seen before is unclear. However, in 2020, series composer Jim Dooley began uploading cut game tracks to his YouTube channel, one titled Outro Black Pete. Maybe this was a scrapped name for Big Bad Pete or even an all-new character. Regardless, the answer is still unclear. Shores of the Thinner Ocean Similar to what would eventually become Disney Gulch in Epic Mickey 2, this entry is in reference to a cut level from the original game that took place, well, on the shores of the thinner ocean. This gloomy beach would have been littered with vintage Disney merchandise, also similar to Mickey Junk Mountain. Concept art of this level does exist, and I honestly wish this was a level that made it into the game. This could have been something really, really interesting. McBasil Rocks a deactivated Tumblr user by the name McBasilRocks is known in the game's community for their posting of cut content from the series. The user even went as far as to get in touch with the game's concept artist, Adam Fenton, in search of answers regarding what original concepts of the series ended up on the cutting room floor. Again, go check out the Game History Secrets video linked in the description if you want to see what they found. Like I said though, the McBasilRocks Tumblr account has since been deactivated and finding a lot of their posts can take some digging. Radio appears both in Wasteland and Mickey's Real House. Mickey's Radio makes multiple appearances both in Louie's house and Bog Easy in the first game, and in a pretty easy to miss cameo, the radio also appears in Mickey's Real House in the cartoon world. The Jug Pump in the first game's opening cutscene, after Mickey makes a mess of Yen Sid's paint and thinner, we see the blot seep into Wasteland from this jug of thinner, unleashing the thinner disaster and the blot itself. The jug is referenced many times throughout the game as the containment space or the prison that holds the blot. The jug was actually planned to be a level of its own using those godforsaken underwater physics.
Gremlin Marcus's fate. Gremlin Marcus has a pretty decently sized role in Epic Mickey, but he does not appear at all in the second game. However, his cousin with an identical character model, Jam Face, plays a large part in the game's story in the same vein of Marcus. The reason for this is Marcus is crushed by an operating table before the events of Epic Mickey 2 and needed someone to fill in for Whoops. him. Oh dear, poor Marcus was put on medical leave when he got stuck under the table. His cousin, Jam Face, took over the projector duty in his absence to make them friends. Sentient Brush This clip posted by Robbie on YouTube shows that, originally, the magic brush Mickey uses was meant to be fully sentient and move on its own. Thanks to Reddit user Fungus Nitrogen for showing me this clip and helping me with this entry. Their page will be linked in the description. The Epcot and MGM Studios ship this piece of concept art depicts an old, beat-up steamboat featuring attractions from both Epcot and MGM Hollywood Studios parks in Walt Disney World, including the now-defunct Earful Tower, Spaceship Earth, and the infamous Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. This art was one of my first introductions to Epic Mickey, and needless to say, I was hooked from the get-go. Mushroom Village Going back to the concept drawing of the large Mickey blotling, the background depicts a land of giant mushrooms. No level like this exists in the game, but similar oversized fungi appear alongside the cut Wonderland section of the game, so it's possible that these mushrooms were planned to be part of that specific area. Tomorrow City Hopper Origins all Beetleworks enemies throughout the series have Toon armor protecting their animatronic parts. This armor is almost always made up of some kind of Disney merchandise to the sort. Almost. The Hopper enemies in Tomorrow City have been confirmed to be made up of parts of the sign for Walt Disney World's Tomorrowland. The head, however, has unknown origins. That's it. The head of this particular enemy does not have a known piece of Disney memorabilia serving as inspiration. Or maybe it does? The most likely inspiration could be the helmet of the wandering spaceman from Tomorrowland in 1959. It's not exactly accurate, but you can definitely see the connection. Shout out to Bane for pointing this out to me. Wasteland was originally a dumpster behind the Walt Disney Studios lot. This one is pretty self-explanatory. Even though Wasteland's portal ended up being in Yen Sid's workshop, which is admittedly more magical, the first draft of the story saw Wasteland existing within a dumpster behind the Walt Disney Studios lot in Burbank, California. And it was also conceptualized to be in a dumpster behind Sleeping Beauty Castle in Disneyland. Digitally Colored Tunes Starting in the late 80s, Disney Animation began using digital means to color their hand-drawn cartoons, and the first film to feature this would be The Little Mermaid in 1989. What does this mean for Epic Mickey? Since any post-1989 Disney character is colored digitally, and many of these Disney Renaissance-era characters appear in Power of Illusion, it begs the question, how would they be affected by thinner, if at all? I like how this entry really made me think, and is a totally valid question regarding the series lore. Camp Pirate Whales the first Epic Mickey supposedly featured an enemy in Ventureland that was scrapped due to file corruption. The enemy even had their own page on the Epic Mickey wiki. Even though the page claims screenshots of the enemy exist, no concrete evidence has ever surfaced and no one has been able to contact the creator of the page. The page itself was deleted a number of years ago because of the lack of sources. However, on April 1st, 2022, a new wiki page was created for the Camp Pirate Whales containing concept art and confirmation of the character's existence via Chase Jones' interview. Take a look. Yeah, it was an April Fool's joke. Real evidence of these enemies has yet to make its way online. Madam Leona is a real ghost. I kind of spoiled this entry a little while ago in case you missed it. In Lonesome Manor, if you talk to the Marvel busts, one of them will tell Mickey, cartoon ghosts aren't really ghosts. They were never alive, so to speak. The implication here is that the Lonesome Ghosts are simply tunes based off of ghosts, but all of the other ghosts, including Madame Leona, are actual ghosts. Especially seeing that the ghosts of Lonesome Manor are not affected by Thinner, while the Lonesome Ghosts are. These? Real ghosts. These? Not real. Fanny Cottontail and the Whereabouts of Other Oswald Characters The early Oswald cartoons featured Oswald's first love interest, Fanny Cottontail, along with many other unnamed characters. Fanny would not stay part of the Oswald canon for long, as she was soon replaced with Hortensia. After this, Fanny and the other side characters within the Oswald cartoons would fade into obscurity, not even appearing in Wasteland in any of the Epic Mickey games or comics. And that begs the question, where are they now? Inky Mickey and the 2007 Reel 
a technical demonstration of what would later become Epic Mickey, was created in 2007 and it was a far departure from what we ended up seeing in the final game. Mickey's design was drastically changed, as were the spatters, and even the setting looked nothing like what I assume is supposed to be Mean Street. The most major change was Mickey's ability to attack his enemies. Instead of using the iconic brush, Mickey would seemingly throw paint or ink directly from his hands and would surf on it as a method of travel. It's super interesting to see an early version of the game and how different it could have been, but I'm honestly glad we got the version of the game that we did. I'm not a huge fan of the 2007 Reels art design, and I love the symbolism that comes from the brush itself. The True Guardians of Wasteland The first Epic Mickey introduced players to the Guardians, otherwise known as the Tints and Terps that we talked about way back in Part 1, and have existed since Wasteland was created. However, the sequel introduced the Spirit of Wasteland and the Sisters of Angel Caverns, who are also stated to have existed since Wasteland's creation. Confusing? Yeah, it is. No official statement has been made on this, so this entry is simply in reference to the skepticism that surrounds which of these are the true Guardians of Wasteland. Which do you think it is? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to know any theories you guys have on this one. Unused Cow Texture in Dark Beauty Castle Courtyard Dolphin is one of the most commonly used emulation softwares for playing Wii games on PC. Dolphin has a texture ripping feature that allows those brave enough to dig through a game's files to find secrets within its source code, and we already know how strong-willed we Epic Mickey fans are. Using this feature, it was discovered that a texture exists for what seems to be a cow in the courtyard of Dark Beauty Castle. Oswald's original intentions with Mickey on the Moonliner this one is kind of long, but it's super interesting and I wanted to save it until later on. Back when Epic Mickey's story was still being conceptualized, Oswald was originally planned to be the central antagonist of the game. Warren Spector loved the idea until he spoke with John Lasseter, yes, that John Lasseter, who told him that it wouldn't make sense for Oswald's first appearance in a Disney property in 80 years to be as a villain. Spector really wrestled with this until finally realizing that Oswald really deserved a chance at redemption. At that point, Oswald became more of the sympathetic rival we saw in the first game. However, it does seem that Oswald would still have a few moments through which his selfish, villainous side snuck its way through. For example, Oswald's plan to use the Moonliner to allow Mickey's return home was met with some confusion from Gus when he tells Oswald that without a heart, the two of them won't be able to leave Wasteland, to which Oswald responds by walking away. We see later, after the blot makes off with Mickey's heart, Oswald's frustration starts to boil over when he says that no one can get out of here without that heart, to which Mickey asks, no one? Oswald brushes off Mickey's question, changing the subject. Finally, upon setting all of the fireworks in the towers of Dark Beauty Castle, Mickey finds Oswald next to Hortensia, still in her inert form. Oswald tells Mickey that he knows the thinner disaster was an accident by saying, For a while, I did mean to... Uh, the rocket. Never mind. I made my share of messes. These instances don't seem too significant on their own, but when they're placed together, it paints an obvious picture <laughs> as to what Oswald's original intentions were. Constance Hatchaway's disappearance. So this is it, the bottom of the bottom, the last entry on the iceberg. And as a diehard Haunted Mansion fan, I thought this would be a fitting end. Constance Hatchaway is the ghostly bride who appears throughout the Haunted Mansion attraction in Disney parks throughout the world. She has killed every man she's married by means of decapitation. Get it? Hatchaway? I, uh. Long story short, it's been said that Constance was the former head. Get it? Head? I hate it here. Of the Lonesome Manor household, and if you couldn't tell Lonesome Manor was based on the Haunted Mansion, I have no idea what to tell you. What's interesting though is that she is said to be the former head of Lonesome Manor, but no longer is as she doesn't appear anywhere in the game at all. Is it possible that she's been freed from Wasteland? I mean, as a ghost, she doesn't have a heart, I think. But the Haunted Mansion has always been a popular ride, so what was she doing in Wasteland in the first place? Maybe she's capable of traveling between Wasteland and the cartoon world whenever she wants? Either way, I love the addition of Constance Hatchaway to the Epic Mickey lore. I would love to see an Epic Mickey 3 in which she appears as a boss, or even a character who provides some eerie advice. One can only dream. And now it's time for that part of the video, that's right, the corrections portion. So before we call this iceberg an iceberg, let's see where we went wrong. First, Abe's line in Epic Mickey 2 regarding the Stormblot has less to do with the Stormblot itself and more about the context of it. Chase Jones confirmed that the citizens of Wasteland actually referred to the Blot as the Stormblot. Even in the original game's data, the character is called the Stormblot. So, in-universe, this line is in reference to the Blot from the first game and not the cut Oswald merged Shadow Blot concept.
heading up Mickey Junk Mountain. Mickey defeated the Shadow Blot. Thought everything was good, too. What he didn't know was that there was an even bigger blot. A storm blot. One that could destroy all of Wasteland. Something I didn't think I was entirely wrong with was the NPC inconsistencies entry, with the telephone swapping genders between the first and second game. But I did miss the main point of that entry, so I wanted to clarify a couple of things. Two characters that exist and appear in both games are Jack Kelly and the Cinema Usher. In Epic Mickey, Jack is a horse and the Usher is a cow. But in Epic Mickey 2, their species are switched. These two particular NPCs are the ones this entry is in reference to. Going back to the Italian magazine Topolino, I didn't go too in-depth with this entry, but something that deserves to be brought up is the fact that an entire Epic Mickey 2 graphic novel was released in the second Epic Mickey issue that, to this day, has never been widely published in English. Something else I didn't mention in part 2 is the fact that Topolino is the Italian name for Mickey Mouse, so it's basically Mickey Mouse magazine in Italy. The popular character likenesses entry is more in reference to the Beetle works that feature parts of well-known Disney characters, such as the Hades head tanker, or this Beetle works with the head of Ursula from The Little Mermaid. Finally, there is actually some pretty substantial proof that Epic Mickey Power of Illusion does in fact take place after Epic Mickey 2. The game's digital manual contains a story section that explains the events in Wasteland that led to the arrival of the Castle of Illusion. Gus finds that the Castle of Illusion landed directly on Tomorrow City Square after he fixed the projector screen there that had been broken because of the quakes between Epic Mickey 1 and 2. But in Epic Mickey 2, Tomorrow City appears completely unharmed and intact. Special thanks to Dylan Lawrence on YouTube for letting me know about this, as well as the creator of this iceberg, Goomba Broadcast, for sending me footage of the digital manual. Speaking of which, I said in part one that I don't have a way to capture my own gameplay or even run Dolphin on my Mac, so finding gameplay for certain aspects or even entire entries on the iceberg was a bit difficult, and one entry I just couldn't find footage on was the Blot's cameo on the outside of the cinema in Epic Mickey 2. Midway through editing part two though, I received a message from an individual by the name of Bane, and they have been so incredibly helpful throughout this process. They offered to capture gameplay for me, make edits or script changes, pretty much anything that I might have needed. Because of them, I'm now able to show you the Blot's cameo in Epic Mickey 2. You spray thinner on the cinema wall here and bam, Blot. Apologies for not having this sooner, but the fact that we have this now is a true testament to the Epic Mickey community. Thanks so much again to Bane for their help here. And of course, another major thank you to the creator of this iceberg, Z Broadcast or Goomba Broadcast, for their help in getting everything in absolute tip-top shape for this part of the explanation. They proofread my script and made sure everything was up to par with everything they wanted this iceberg to be. And just a general thank you for even creating this iceberg. This has been an absolute saga and it wouldn't have been possible if it weren't for you and and your love for this wonderful series. And wow, we're done. We've completed the Disney Epic Mickey Iceberg. Do you like my little microphone? He's a friend. If you made it to the end of this video, I just want to say thank you so much and I appreciate you for making it to the end of this little adventure of mine. This has been one of the most fun projects I've ever had the pleasure of working on. I love this series, I love how accepting the fan base has been toward me and my videos, and I love getting to do the whole YouTube thing. So if you've been enjoying what I've been cooking up for the past few months, be sure to hit subscribe and like this video. I would really love to have you along for the ride. So. Do that. Like I said, I love this series. I even had the collector's edition, but I lost my little Mickey figure that came with it and I can't find one online, so I'm really bummed about that. So this has been a blast for me and I can't thank those who helped me along the way enough for everything that they've done. If you helped me personally throughout this process and I have not given you the credit that you deserve, please reach out to me. I'll be happy to make sure that you are getting the credit that you deserve because trust me, I couldn't have done this by myself. It takes a village and this particular village has been super kind to me. So I want to return the favor. Something else that's really cool. I have a Patreon now. That is right. For as little as a dollar every month, you're getting access to content that I wouldn't normally have posted on my YouTube channel. This is behind the scenes content, blooper reels, fun small little side projects I'm working on, and top tier patrons will get a thank you at the end of every video, and you have an influence on what kind of videos I will be making. Super, super cool stuff. If you have any interest in becoming a patron for me, I would really appreciate it, and I will have my Patreon linked in the description down below. And of course, I don't want to leave you guys totally 
in the dark on what's coming next for the channel, so I wanted to give you a few little hints as to what's coming next. There's a certain movie coming out within the next couple of weeks that I am really, really excited for, and I want to celebrate it in some way, so if you are a Disney fan, you're in good company because Disney is going to be the next video too. I won't say what it is, but just be excited for it. And it will also be the first thing I've posted on my channel in the format of what I want to be posting that isn't an iceberg video. Something a little bit more laid back and kind of personal, so get excited for that too because that video is going to be a lot of fun. But yeah, I think that kind of covers everything. Thank yous, Patreon, what's coming next? I don't think I'm forgetting anything. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you all so much for watching this series that I have put so much of my heart and myself into. To say I worked on this video throughout my entire senior year of college is not an exaggeration. I found the iceberg image way back in October of 2021, and then I reached out to Guma Broadcast about doing a video on it, and after months of writing and producing and editing, we are here at the end, and I could not be more proud of how far these videos have come. Thank you so much again to everybody that stuck it out to the end of this iceberg. I appreciate you so much. This has been the Disney Epic Mickey Iceberg Explained. I have been Evan. Thank you guys so much for watching. Have a very happy birthday and sleep tight. I'm done!